Well, if you've been keeping up with things, you've read the article and seen the news about they're claiming that they've uh, found the God particle. That they got more stuff about the Higgs boson. So, I'm going to bring you some Gary Stearman and a, a couple year old chat he and J.R. Church had concerning the God particle. Time for another Prophecy in the News daily update, and I want to talk today about CERN on this Thursday, March the 14th, because there is a, a, a very big headline in the news today from the Associated Press, and it says, The search is all but over for a subatomic particle that is crucial, a crucial building block of the universe. Now, this particle is called the Higgs boson, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Physicists announced Thursday they believe they have discovered the subatomic particle predicted nearly a half century ago, uh, which will go a long way toward explaining what gives electrons and all matter in the universe size and shape. And so this particle called the Higgs boson, elsewhere known as the God particle, I'm sure you've read about it in the news, is supposed to be the particle that makes the universe what it is. It gives size, it gives shape, it gives uh, sticking power, and we'll talk about that a little bit later because it's said to be the particle that has the strong force that holds together the other fleeting tiny particles in an atom. And if it weren't for the Higgs boson, all those particles would fly apart and there would be no matter at all. <clears throat> Well, scientists have now finished uh, going through their entire data set, uh, and this uh, statement was issued by the Associated Press from Joe Incandela, uh, a physicist who uh, heads up one of the two main research groups at CERN, and here's a quote, the preliminary results with the full 2012 data set are magnificent, and to me, says Mr. Incandela, it is clear that we are dealing with the Higgs boson. Well, what's the importance of the Higgs boson? Well, back on the 30th of March in 2010, <coughs> the CERN particle accelerator was turned on for the first time. By the way, CERN, CERN, translated into English, means European Organization for Nuclear Research. And there on the Swiss-French border near Geneva, underground is a five and a half mile diameter uh, tunnel filled with electronics, electrical cables, refrigerating units, uh, liquid nitrogen, who knows, multi-billion, billion dollar apparatus that's designed to smash particles together so that the atoms can be examined and it can be determined what they're made of. It's sort of like, uh, you want to know what's, uh, what grandfather's watch is made of, you put it on a table, hit it with a hammer, and examine the little pieces, and then write a paper on that, and say, well, grandfather's watch had a little tiny piece of metal, and it had a little round piece of metal with teeth on the outside, and it had another little round piece of metal with teeth on, well, you get the idea. It would take a while to reconstruct grandfather's watch from just looking at the particles. That's what they are doing uh, at CERN. And it's kind of fascinating. The huge machine, and this is from an article that I wrote back uh, in the uh, May 2010 Prophecy in the News magazine. The huge machine is called a Hadron Collider <clears throat> because this general term from the Greek hadros, uh, which means stout or thick, denotes massive particles like protons and neutrons. They are held together by the so-called strong force. And it is this force, that is the application of the strong force, that holds atoms together and so, so that they are stable elements, if you will. <clears throat> Imagine, uh, and we've all played with magnets, Imagine trying to push uh, two magnets together. Uh, positive pole to positive pole. What do they do? They repel each other. And when you've all played around with magnets and they push apart in your hands, if you have them turned in the wrong direction, you flip them around the other direction, they stick together. Everybody's experienced that. That's very similar to what we're talking about here. There's a strong atomic force that holds things together in spite of their charges. <clears throat> because if it weren't for this strong particle, they would all fly apart. Hence, the particle is called the God particle. 
the collect collective search for a mysterious something they had labeled the God particle and for the force that is associated with it and it's called the boson and for reasons that we stated earlier uh, it was named after a physicist named, whose last name was Bose uh, an elementary particle imbued with great weight and force that's why it is called the boson it is strong, it is powerful it has it contains uh, a strong enough force that if tiny particles are flying by it can capture them and hold them in one place and create a stable atomic entity and that's the importance of this tiny uh, particle or called the boson uh, imagine if you will the scientists had control of the boson but perhaps they could formulate it fabricate it using various techniques if they could do that, they could create matter, and that's exactly what's in their mind. If you, uh, if you could control the strong nuclear force, ultimately, <clears throat> you could make matter out of nothing. Uh, maybe you want to make yourself a five-pound chunk of gold. Well, it would be possible if you could control the strong nuclear force, and, and uh, it would be a very nice thing to be able to create chunks of gold out of nowhere. So you can see why the race is on to discover uh, the ability uh, to emulate what the Higgs boson with its strong nuclear force is now doing. And as always, I try to make some biblical application uh, to the news. And to today, the biblical application is absolutely clear. Uh, I'm picking up my Bible reading from Hebrews chapter 1. <clears throat> and the first three verses of Hebrews are absolutely wondrous in their extent and I'm going to read them right now Hebrews 1 1 through 3 God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Those exalted words have in them a, a very, very interesting phrase. And let's read it again. Uh, this is verse... 3, and I'm going to read just the first part of verse 3, which we uh, read a moment ago. It says here, Who, and that of course would be the Lord, being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. This is, they're speaking, we're speaking about the Lord Jesus here, and the writer to the Hebrews describes Jesus as upholding all things by the word of his power. Upholding, uh, from the Greek phero, means to literally to keep in stasis, to hold things as they are. And I want to submit to you on the basis of uh, all that we've read about the uh, particle accelerator at CERN and, and the, 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 the quest to discover the Higgs boson and the uh, the elementary power that holds all things together. I want to submit to you that I know what that power is. It's the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, uh, Jesus, let's face it, he's the God particle. That everybody's looking for. <laughs> That's my. Yes, he is. And you heard him mention that it holds things together. So, if you can figure out how to hold things together, well, you pulled a little. Boast them out, boast them out, and uh, things come apart. 
so you could probably weaponize it too, eh? Well, this is back uh, a couple of years ago when they were talking about it. Let's play you a little brief portion of that. He's with his late partner, J.R. Church. Now, Gary, in the first <laughs> chapter of Genesis, after God creates the heavens and the earth, the Bible says, and the earth was without form. Yes. What does that mean? Well, without form, uh, uh, the... No rhyme or reason to it? What it Just simply matters. means is in a state of of chaos, uh, a state that, that lacked specific uh, building blocks or lines of force. And we read in the Bible that God then organized that chaos and out of it came creation. The oh, Jews say that intelligent he Intelligent design. Yes, all intelligent design. Wow. And the Jews call it the ten utterances of God, in which he, he uttered certain things and the earth progressively took on order. Now, if the scientists at CERN were able to create matter, yes, the next thing they would want to do is put a little intelligent design to it. Oh, of think? course. And that's what's in their motive. When you read their literature, it's obvious this is only step one. So, step one is finding matter. So they're not going to say, okay, we got some matter now. In uh, 15 billion years, it's going to develop into yeah. some beautiful things. They're not going to want to wait around 15 billion years. They're, no. going to go, they're going to want to say, let's take it to the laboratory and see what kind of intelligent design we can give this, what we can make it into. Yeah, basically that's it. That, to me, is the most blasphemous thought that a, science, a group of scientists could have who have denied that God, in his intelligent design, designed the earth, and yet at the same time, they want to do what they claim God couldn't do. Amazing. Well, Jr. I remember the book of Job, <clears throat> and I remember how Job was tested. Job, a righteous man, was tested by God, and after all the testing, he had an interview with God. And the first words out of God's mouth as he spoke to Job, he said, and I'm reading Job 38, 1 and following, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel? by words without knowledge. Gird up thine loins like a man, <clears throat> for I will demand of thee, and thou wilt answer me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. And God goes on and asks Job a series of questions. Uh -huh. Were you there when I created the heavens and the earth? And of course, what can Job say? No. <laughs> and we have it from uh, from Genesis 1, from John 1, from Hebrews chapter 1, from the book of Job, it's all through the Bible. God created the heavens and the earth, and he regards man, who uh, would question this, as a little bit out of his mind. He, God says, you need to listen to me, because I created all this. Until next time. Yep, he did. Made the whole thing. I hope this makes you think about what they're doing with CERN because they, you know, this is going to open up a, oh, a whole lot of things. And I spoke on this before a few times. Uh, I'm going to be going into the uh, prophecy of the Pope some more since we have a new elected Pope, Francis. Uh, some of the commenters don't seem to be able to understand. Uh, because he chose the name Francis and not Peter. So they didn't get it and understand it. They think since he didn't choose Peter, it's a fail. So I'm still doing some research into Francis and his family and his background, etc. And when I get that completed, I'll be making another follow-up to that to explain why this did fulfill and why the name Francis doesn't throw it off just because Francis is not the name Peter. So y'all check on uh, CERN. <laughs>